Over 4,000 years ago, men began working in glass, using presses or cutting objects from a solid mass to make beads, dishes, and later on, mosaics. But around 30 BC in Alexandria, perhaps by a pure stroke of inspiration, someone put a hollow rod to a bleb of heated glass and blew into it. Suddenly, with experience and skill, almost any hollow shape became possible, and the art of glass blowing was born. It was an art that at some periods was almost forgotten, and at others became highly developed and prolific in the production of useful and beautiful objects. But not until the 19th century, as the experimental laboratory developed, did the methods and objectives of glass blowing change much. And even then, the vessels of chemistry were for the most part standardized, or else relatively simple in structure. It has been in the 20th century, particularly since the Second World War, with the increasing complexity of experimental physics, chemistry, and related fields in industry and the universities, that scientific glassblowing has emerged as a specialized art. The glassblower has become an indispensable adjunct to experimental science. And since there are no instant geniuses in glassblowing, it is increasingly important for the scientist to become familiar with the glassblowing shop, and what sorts of things the glassblower can do for him. To pursue one example, as complex and rigorous in its design as anything the old glassblowers fashioned, we'll watch the construction of a cryostat, custom built for Raman studies of crystals for physicist Steve Boggs at the University of Toronto. In my work, for instance, we're measuring properties of solid hydrogen. Solid hydrogen freezes at 20 degrees above absolute zero. So we have to immerse it in uh, liquid helium. And to contain liquid helium, which boils at four degrees above absolute zero, you have to have a very good thermos bottle. And this is what glass is to us. Before construction begins, scale drawings of the various stages are prepared. In this case, foreshortened and color coded for ease of reference. The pedestal orange, the innermost vessel blue, the second red, the third yellow, the fourth green, and the fifth purple. A further cross-section indicates the eventual location of the vacuum and the liquid helium and the nitrogen chambers in the finished cryostat. I see one thing I'd like to change already, and that is this tapered section. We'll eliminate that. I don't think it's really necessary. Now, as far as these windows on the inner vessel, this will have to be tried on a trial model first. And if we can pull this off, then we're, we've got the problem beat. A doer of this sort is particularly valuable for Raman effect spectroscopy. Uh, a great deal has been learned about hydrogen from the Raman effect, uh, from about oxygen, and studies are still going on in both. A cryostat is essentially a very sophisticated thermos bottle. Its five walls contain one liquid nitrogen 
and two liquid helium chambers, which must be separated from each other, and from the outside atmosphere by two further chambers containing a common vacuum. But unlike the case of the thermos bottle, the experiments the cryostat is used for require that laser light be projected through the walls onto the inner sample and be collected back from the sample with minimal distortion of the entering and exiting light. This necessitates the building in of ports and optically polished windows, and that's where the real challenge confronts the glassblower. There are still many, many puzzling features, especially in solid hydrogen, which happens to be a quantum crystal and uh, a substance which is completely unique. It's the only molecular quantum crystal. Uh, it is a molecular crystal with a very rich spectrum, and the number of features in it is uh, almost unlimited. A major problem in constructing a Dewar of this size is that of aligning such long cylindrical sections concentrically around a common axis. We started with 70 millimeter and raised to 90 millimeter, which goes, the 70 goes into the 90, the 90 goes inside the 110, uh, the 110 goes inside the 150 millimeter, and the 150 goes inside the 178 millimeter. Essentially, the problem is overcome by building top and bottom sections independently, with the exception of the innermost vessel, and then progressively fusing top and bottom sections together in five separate stages. At all of these stages, the glassblower's constant concern is to detect stress, that condition of glass overstrained by temperature, which will create an Achilles heel in the finished work, and which must be detected by viewing the glass against a light box through a polarized lens and annealing out the stress marks. The pedestal, orange, is first prepared independently with a window on its inward-facing rim. The uh, window we use in this particular doer is, is ground and polished. Uh, we buy these from supply house and they're, they're particular ones we're using are Pyrex. And these are cut to the diameter that which we need for the particular opening we want to put on. And uh, then these are fused to the, the cryostat. They're optically flat and ground and polished. This is to stop distortion of the laser light going in uh, so that it goes in a nice clear beam rather than being distorted and reflected all over the Place. The pedestal is then mounted in the bottom of blue by means of a ring seal. A 12 millimeter extension is added. Then the side ports are pulled, also carefully ground and rounded to the radial curvature of the inside of the next wall, and fire polished. We pre-make a holder, pack the pedestal, with asbestos tape. And then we insert this into the glass tube, the, I believe it's a 75 millimeter. And uh, then we proceed to put it in the chuck, make sure it's running through, and then preheat again, flame it, cut the glass down over the pedestal, and make your ring seal. Caution must be taken here. You've got to blow inside the tube to get the rounded curvatures, but you also must blow into the pedestal side. If not, you'll get a sucking action and the glass will suck in and ruin the seal. So it's very important that you blow in both ends at this particular time. It's fused, and while we fuse this, we blow 
as well as use a paddle to blow the glass up to the paddle so it's running true and uniform. And then when we're finished, we do what they call flame cut, and we paddle it back and put a slight bead in the end so that the outer layer, which comes down out of that, fuses well. And there's good thickness of glass there. Beading is, is uh, really strengthening the end of the glass and making it slightly enlarged at the very end. And this gives it added strength. In making the side ports, you must not blow too large a hole because the piece that you're going to blow out there has to be reamed out and must remain approximately the same thickness as the wall of the vessel itself. So we pull a, blow a small hole, and then we ream this out with a carbon rod first, and then we enlarge it so it's uniform with a hexagon tapered carbon to give it, uh, make it nice and round, and also to sort of heat the glass bag in so we had a, a approximately the same thickness on the port as we have on the walls. After we finish, each operation in the fabrication of this vessel, we take it over to our annealing oven. There are three stages to welding blue to the lower section of red. First, the area of red adjacent to the ports of blue is flame softened, and the surfaces are mated by a temporary seal. We mount this in a special holder for making these side port window seals. This same area is again heated and this time pulled out. We then proceed to bring in a piece on the tailstock of the lathe with a thickened end and daub the glass, the thickened glass end to the middle where the window is going to go and we heat this and do a slow pull and flame cut seal so that the glass comes away well so that's nice and true because this is where the window has to go on for the first stage of the prior step. We hold the window again with a vacuum chuck and we use a very sharp hot hydrogen oxygen flame and we fuse the window to the, the port. Care must be taken not to distort the window because there should be approximately a 25 millimeter opening of absolutely non-distorted glass so that the laser beam will not be deflected in any way. Finally, the uniting of the optically polished windows creates permanent ring seals at the sides. All three ports for the lower section of yellow are pulled separately. Then yellow is wedded to the lower section of green at the ports without the addition of windows. Well, the problem is, is uh, the coefficient of expansion of the glass by uh, the way the seals are made, and these seals aren't made absolutely perfect each time, then you have breakage and uh, expansion, one wall to the other, uh, they will separate on you. And this is what you have to make very, very sure that these seals are absolutely perfect. There can't be any mistake about it. In making this seal from 150 millimeter down, it's only a temporary seal on here to, as a means of using uh, a scrap piece of glass. You flare the one halfway out to meet the 150 millimeter, and you paddle down the 150 millimeter to meet the 75. This is the means of heating the two up, sticking them together, and pulling the glass down so that you keep the same wall thickness over the end as well as the, the same as the thickness of the, the wall of the vessel itself. It can't be too thin and it mustn't be too thick.
The lower section of purple, the fifth and last wall, is again prepared independently with windows mounted at both sides and on the bottom end. This is the final outside layer, which is again mounted in this special chuck that we have adapted for this particular operation. You uh, bring a heavy glass rod into the side, heat the glass sufficiently, dab it on, and then you do a, a blow and pull type seals because you have to have nice rounded radius because this is where you want to seal on your, your glass window again. Do another flame cut again, ream it out with the carbon, and make your uh, your seal, your window seal again, by means of a vacuum chuck. You must make sure alignment is is properly. Uh, one of the methods we use here is to put a grease pencil mark around and measure the distance halfway around on the glass and scribe it with a diamond. And this is where you daub your rod on to, to pull away the glass, because they, these windows must align perfectly because they have to line up with the previous ports and windows. operation here we have brought the glass down around to a, and, and put it in the lathe and out of the chuck and into a horizontal from a vertical to horizontal position and close the end down and putting in the bottom seal of the outer layer this is the same method again brought down paddle down uh, to the diameter which we, we desire, and then it's flame cut, vacuum chuck the window again, and then it's sealed on. And then we use a diamond or a tungsten carbide uh, knife, put a slight mark on it. We use a hot flame, rotate the lathe until we have it heated sufficiently, and this is what is known as a uh, scribe shock cut and this is how we cut all our large tubing now the innermost vessel and the lower sections of the other four walls have been prepared in three discrete units We return to blue and red, where first the holes A and B are made for pouring in helium. After that, the upper section of red is fused on. We now go back to the beginning, and with the first and second layer, we have joined on a piece with a flanged end on the one with the sufficient holes put in. We now bring the second layer over and make a uh, butt seal uh, at the appropriate length. Next comes a crucial stage whereby the upper section of red is sealed to the upper section of yellow at the top end, at the same time fusing the heavy gauge flange glass to the seal. connects the inner doer to the outer doer. And this is the main support for the complete cry step. Uh, you, by means of a ring seal, and when this ring seal is completed, it is then sealed on to what they call a QVF pipe flange. Now you have to seal 
one sixteenth inch glass to approximately three eighths of an inch glass. And this must be a smooth, uniform seal because you have two surfaces. This connects the the vacuum space to the liquid space. And this is the critical seal which makes the main support of the tristyle. When the three-way join is completed, the temporary outer sleeve is shock cut and removed, leaving an appropriate extension of the top section of yellow for the next join. This is making the fourth and fifth layer seal. The glass, the fifth layer is supported in with corrugated paper to the, to the fifth layer. The top sections of green and purple are separately prepared by means of a seal at their upper end. The glass is then heated and flared out to meet the 178 millimeter glass, and this glass is fused, nice rounded radius, and care must be taken so that the paddle is put in there so you do not distort the inner layer at this particular time because this will interfere with the sliding of the first, second, and third layer into this doer. Now the lower sections of yellow and green, prepared earlier as a single unit, are joined on, the green extending the appropriate distance to form the next join. We chuck the glass in the lathe and we align it by tapping it with our closed fist. And this is for alignment so it runs absolutely true. So uh, this is a good means of doing this better than any other means of using wood or paddle or this. We blow into this at this particular area by mouth as well as using centrifugal force because sometimes when making these large seals you have gases in there and they have a tendency to suck in and this is why we have both used both means of, of blowing. The top section of green and purple, which again was prepared separately as a single unit, is next fused on at the point shown. This is the doer part that we fabricated earlier. Now this is going to be sealed to the, the cryostat, put in the, the lathe and chucked again, and uh, make this seal to, to bring the, the glass out to the original fifth layer, and this is getting to the finale. We chuck it for alignment again in both ends of the lathe, and then we bring the doer seal part, which we made previously, and we get this aligned, and then we pack the third and fourth layer by asbestos pads so that we don't get any sag when we make this seal. 
And after the seal is made, this, these pads remain in until the final annealing. This is seal is made by centrifugal force spin. The glass is spun out against the paddle. We have seal on the side vacuum tube. This is where we evacuate the vessel from in the last stage before use. This was sealed on previously, but not shown. Finally, the lower windowed section of purple is united to complete the cryostat. This is chucked at both ends of the lathe again, both the head and tail stock. And uh, the asbestos pads still remain in there. But we also put in extra pads so that we have a bearing surface of approximately eight inches. And we put a, a metal stainless steel band around, and this is tightened down because this has to support whole doer, which is 30 to 40 pounds. And we can't have too much pressure on there or you only crack the glass. After this second to last stage, the cryostat is removed from the lathe and placed in the oven in a vertical position to avoid sagging. It is slowly brought up to 565 degrees centigrade. It's held there for about five minutes and then allowed to return very slowly to room temperature. This way, all the remaining stresses and strains are removed. Now complete, the cryostat is prepared to withstand all the extreme changes of temperature and sudden thermal shock that will be required of it in the study of gases in their solid state.